Good afternoon. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, I hereby call to order the third meeting of the 14th session of the Conference of Parties to the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification. We are here to discuss CSOs, which form a very critical part of our decision-making process. They are critical to our decision-making because they add value to the subject at hand and bring a fresh perspective. I do hope that when we hear their views, we factor them in in our thought process as well as the general perspective that we have about things. I am sure as we go along with the discussions today, the CSOs would come up with constructive, cooperative and positive ideas which we can incorporate in the subject matters and which are helpful to the COP and its decision-making process. So I welcome you all today. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, as you may recall, decision 27 of COP1 called for the inclusion of open dialogue sessions organized by non-governmental organizations within the official program of the work of sessions of the Conference of the Parties. In accordance with that decision and with the provisional agenda and tentative schedule of work for this 14th session of the Conference of the Parties contained in the document ICCD slash COP 14 slash 1, I now invite the conference to begin its open dialogue session on the inclusion of activities of civil society organizations within the official programs of the work of the Conference of the Parties. Distinguished delegates, the topic of today's open dialogue session is in inclusive dialogue on land tenure in the context of land degradation neutrality. And Mr. Octavio Perez Pardo from CIAAC Argentina has kindly agreed to facilitate this open dialogue. On behalf of the conference, I warmly welcome our facilitator, Mr. Pardo, and all our distinguished speakers today. Without any further ado, I now turn the meeting over to the facilitator of this dialogue, Mr. Perez Pardo. Mr. Pardo. Gracias, señor presidente. Thank you, Chair. So, it's an honor for civil society to be chairing here this open dialogue alongside the Deputy Secretary of the Convention. So therefore, we'd like to thank you on behalf of uh, the various accredited civil society organizations here. We'd like to thank you both for taking part in this important event as well. I am uh, Mr. Octavio Perez Pardo from the School of Engineers from my province in Argentina and president of the Federation of Agricultural Engineers in my country. So today I'll be moderating this interactive dialogue. Today, as the chair said, we'll be speaking about a new and emerging issue. It's a very relevant issue. COP 13 in decision 7 uh, took note of the voluntary guidelines on responsible land governance, fisheries and forests. So that's why we're gathered here today for this dialogue. I'd also like to remind you that in COP13 in Ordos, the ministers highlighted in their high-level segment that in order to ensure an adequate and sustainable land management, 
we'd have to place as a central topic land tenure. We're aware that each country has sovereignty, has its own characteristics, and is uh, guided by its own rules and guidelines and rules on land tenure. So statutory tenure, such as the private land tenure, and also state land tenure. There's also customary land tenure, where land is managed by, for example, indigenous communities or farming communities. We believe it's very important, though, to understand that land security is a topic which goes beyond the type of tenure of land. I think this is really a central element for our debates here today. Security in the land tenure regime in each country is undoubtedly a source of motivation in order to invest. It is undoubtedly a good link to food security as well, to the creation of jobs and employment, to reducing poverty, to ensuring gender equality. Often in general, women have secondary rights over land. Therefore, civil society organizations today in this interactive dialogue understand that the voluntary guidelines on land governance are what need to be discussed in depth. We need to establish links with the land degradation neutrality regime as well. So today I'll tell you how we're going to work this afternoon. We have five panelists here today, one for each region and for each group, uh, representing various organizations. I will give the floor to the, each of them. Each panelist will provide a presentation on the realities in their region. The presentations should not go beyond seven or eight minutes each. After that, I'll open up the floor to everyone here present so that they can take part within this uh, dialogue, this dialogue between civil society and governance. I think uh, we'll have about 30 or 40 minutes of that, and I'll come back to the bureau or to the panel here to hear their responses. Responses are around two or three minutes each. And after that, we'll begin the second part of our session. We'll have some questions and some maybe motivating ideas to try and see if we can move forwards or think about how we can move forwards with the process in the future. We need to keep in mind, though, that parties have accepted for the first time at this COP of looking into this topic, so we need to give it the necessary time in order to discuss it in depth. Finally, I'll come back to the panel again, and we'll draw some final conclusions, and then I'll give the floor to the president of the COP so that they can uh, provide some responses during the closing session. So if you agree with that, we'll begin. And to start, I'll give the floor first to a representative of their region, the region of Europe, Valentin Tobotaro. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I am Valentin Tobotaro from uh, NGO Bios Moldova, and I am a representative of uh, Eastern European country in the civil society organization panel. Also, I am uh, speaking here on behalf of International Land Coalition. Uh, I will present uh, uh, a presentation from uh, uh, my region. And first of all, uh, I, I would like to emphasize that uh, I will focus on uh, a, a tool 
uh, for solution uh, of problems, uh, for promotion and implementation of people-centered land governance. And, uh, yeah, but at the beginning, I would like to say some words about context uh, in uh, our region and uh, with reference to FAO. So in our region, uh, uh, since 90s, uh, it, took uh, uh, it took place and it was ongoing uh, reprivatization of land. And uh, the regulation of access to land and the use of land are marked by a lack of transparency, accountability, equity, and efficiency. Corruption represents a major handicap to land development. And in our region, there are two processes which are going simultaneously. It's a fragmentation during the privatization and con land concentration. Uh, so uh, now, I will, uh, this is the context of the region, but I will uh, speak about uh, uh, experience from Moldova as a pilot experience from our region. Uh, if uh, we are speaking about uh, legal framework, Moldova has a good legal framework. However, it is, lack, uh, is lacking the mechanism of viable implementation of this legislation. And uh, we did an analytical study in Moldova in uh, uh, many communities, and we didn't found any localities where people don't have problems. Farmers, landowners don't have problems with uh, land tenure. And uh, here, and uh, moreover, we um, uh, came to, a, to the conclusion that there are over one million of uh, cases of land rights, of, the, uh, of land rights infringements uh, due to this, uh, and uh, due to the different errors. And uh, thus, the people don't have access to their own land. We have given cases where a decision of the code that said uh, in this, for positive solution of this problem. However, in this case, as you see, uh, during 15 years, the uh, farmer didn't receive uh, his own land, although she has the title deeds on this land. Uh, and uh, their errors are different. Uh, the farmers could find uh, their own lands uh, on uh, 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 in forests, in water basins, in uh, roads, and so on and so forth. Uh, even uh, they are in uh, very degraded uh, lands in gullies. Uh, so, with support of the International Land Coalition, we uh, developed a uh, national, national engagement strategy for the solution of these problems. And uh, we uh, um, applied bottom-up approach and uh, discussed from the local level with all interested parties. And then we had uh, regional uh, uh, meetings. And during the uh, national workshop, we uh, uh, discuss this draft strategy and national engagement strategy and action plan. Uh, this was in 2017. Uh, now, uh, last year and this year, we are implementing, uh, implementing uh, uh, this strategy. And already we have uh, results. The main components of the strategy are as follows. To connect, mobilize, influence this and we have physical and online platform and there are over 130 organizations uh, in uh, our platform from all uh, the region uh, in, in this platform there are a lot of stakeholders there are representatives of central public authorities local public authorities farmers there are researchers, uh, uh, development partners, uh, uh, donors, uh, and uh, uh, cadastral offices, and others. And all these 
uh, is supported by uh, international uh, land coalition. Uh, this is situation, uh, uh, is current situation in Moldova that each stakeholders, stakeholder uh, uh, try to solve this problem uh, separately, but it doesn't work. So, uh, uh, when imp uh, after the implementation of this strategy, but the uh, the first uh, uh, the, this strategy is uh, uh, for uh, uh, the initial period of this strategy is 2017 2021, and then there will be extension. And uh, after the implementation of the strategy, we see that all these people will work together. So, uh, uh, national engagement, uh, the platform of the national engagement strategy works as a bridge between all these stakeholders. And uh, we uh, made a lot of uh, lobby to change the situation. And uh, 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 I would like to say that you have uh, different uh, working groups in this platform, working group of on land tenure, on LDN, on uh, climate change, on organic agriculture, and others. So each group uh, develop, uh, uh, discuss the problems and develop recommendations together with uh, local and public authorities. And uh, uh, due to our activities, the government decided to develop a new regulation on solving the problem of property rights infringement. Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, uh, NES platform is facilitator of this uh, uh, of development of this regulation and the part. Uh, and uh, we already have this draft and we hope that uh, it will be approved this year. NES Moldova is included in uh, uh, the working group for development of this regulation, and we are included in many groups. We uh, were included in the group for development of um, Agenda 2030. And again, due to our efforts and our colleagues from other uh, environmental organizations, we succeed to include the G15 in the national development uh, strategy 2030. So, uh, according, uh, we think that uh, this uh, platform it's, uh, the uh, became uh, already and uh, make the first steps as a bridge uh, to be the main bridge between the main interested stakeholders in this area and uh, only together with them, we, uh, with main stakeholders, we could solve the problems of land tenure and LDN. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Gracias. Thank you, Mr. Valentin Chibataro, for your presentation. Now I'd like to give the floor to the representative of uh, civil society organizations from Asia, Nasi Nasi. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nahid Nagizadeh from an Iranian civil society organization called Senesta, Center for Sustainable Development and Environment. My presentation on behalf of Asian group include Iran, Iraq, India, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka focuses on how Asian CSOs contribute to improve the security of land tenure in their countries uh, and what are their main challenges and recommendations. Yeah. The general context is that land, as we know, is uh, one of the core elements to achieve SDGs, in particular to SDG 15.3, and land degradation neutrality and uh, land restoration. 
uh, and uh, to resolve land issues will increase the barriers to achieve land degradation neutrality and land restoration, as I said, within lands and territories of indigenous mobile pastoralists and local communities. Evidences show that in the pa uh, past decades, existing approaches such as ignoring customary and collective tenure rights of local communities, technical oriented approaches, or not pro poor or gender sensitive approaches have not been successfully addressed. address the land tenure issues. Majority of countries facing challenges on securing land tenure and decreasing pressure on natural resources due to lack of proper policies and regulations, war, displacement, people, allocation of communities, land to extractive industries such as oil, gas, and mining, or big dam construction, urbanization, change of land use, in particular, shifting the range lands to, uh, sorry shifting the range lands to agricultural lands, and all these are very serious threats. There is an, so there is an urgent need to secure land tenure and land-based livelihoods of billion people in the world. In the past decade, new approaches have been emerging for con conservation in general. At the heart of these new approaches, uh, I would like to focus on increased legal recognition of collective and customary tenure rights of indigenous peoples and local communities through indigenous community conserved areas and uh, territories, uh, which stands ICCAs. I will start with Iran. Since 2008, we started to promote understanding the concept of indigenous community conserved areas and territories, which is now accepted by in International Union for Conservation of Nature and UN Convention on Biological Diversity as one of the main type of governance categories for uh, uh, conservation of nature and preservation restoration of lands and uh, natural resources. At the same time, we facilitated uh, to establish and register community-based organization at all levels, at tribal, tribal confederacy levels, and their uh, national union as UNICAMEL, Union for Indigenous Camel Herders of Iran, and Union for Indigenous Nomadic Pastoralists of Iran, to enable those communities for policy influence and reclaiming their rights over their lands and territories. Also, we, uh, and these are some uh, capacity building process with women in desert in the west of Iran and in south of Iran with different nomadic pastoralist communities. And also we developed uh, detailed participatory maps of nomadic territories and their migration routes using p-mapping and participatory geographic information system techniques to uh, know where the invaded lands, where the degraded lands, and where can ha they have uh, developed a community-driven project for land restorations. And uh, still, with such advances, strong challenges remain for implementation of appropriate legal recognition of customary and collective tenure rights of, uh, at various levels, and appropriate policy and legal support for in-depth contribution of all stakeholders, in particular indigenous peoples and local communities in land restoration and conservation. Here we shift, uh, and this is a figure of some challenges for land uh, degradation in Iran. We shift to Iraq. After Islamic State in Al-Sham and Iraq, some provinces such as Ninawa had been totally liberated. The Iraqi CSOs started to respond directly to the returnees' need and address their challenges such as land degradation for stabilization process in targeted areas, which is highly mentioned as agricultural, sorry, as agricultural uh, lands and uh, returned people were mainly depend on their lands and agriculture, so the necessary action was needed to act on their issues. So what Iraqi CSOs done, they enhanced and revived the land-based livelihood and food security for the returnees population with the aim of improving the stability of those peoples in terms of their land issues and livelihoods through land restoration. 
but still they have some challenges such as lack of basic capacity and facilities for daily needs and life of selected areas uh, were new liberated and lack of official documents of the citizens and communities on their lands and various conflict among different stakeholders as well as conflict and challenging process for selection of target communities to be benefit from their projects uh, to for enhancing land-based livelihoods and food security now we are shifting to sorry we are shifting to uh, Indian subcontinent countries, such as India, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka, with their own growing economic challenges and solutions. They also have lots of challenges, such as increased degradation of land due to unsettled land ownership, restricted access of pastoralists to their pastures, lack of sensitization among farmers and pastoralists on land degradation, and access to land certification program and private ownership for agricultural land, and loss of land and productivity uh, from land loss, land degradation, and uh, disasters and climate change issues. And also, exclusion of women, youth, and vulnerable groups in land-related decision-making process. Yeah. What are their demands in these three countries? They want security of land tenure for indigenous peoples, local communities, as well as for women, youth, and vulnerable groups. And they want to be ensure recognition of relationship between land loss, land degradation from climate disasters with my, uh, migration, loss of biodiversity and land tenure rights by the convention, nations, and civil society organizations. And they ask for strong focus on securing land tenure rights within UNCCD COP14 decisions and national uh, legal instruments. And what is our collective? These are our collective recommendations for the COP14 of uh, UNCCD. Uh, they are inclusion, the representatives of indigenous peoples and local communities, CSOs, women, youth, and vulnerable groups in land tenure security decision-making process through a UNCCD COP14 decisions. And capacity building of all stakeholders on a strong implementation of FAO's voluntary uh, tenure guideline as a fundamental need for sustainable land governance at all levels and legal and policy support to recognition, collective and customary land tenure of communities and territories and their lands through community concept areas and territories, ICCAs, which has been accepted by IUCN and UNCBD. And preventing land fragmentation of nomadic pastoralist territories and lands, and stop allocation those lands to other purposes and developing projects. And finally, policy, legal, and financial support of displaced peoples due to war and political conflicts through land degradation neutrality projects in liberated areas of Iraq and other uh, affected uh, areas from national and international bodies. Thank you so much for your attention. Gracias, Nahid. Thank you very much, madam for your presentation. And now I would like to give the floor to Pablo Mota, representative for the region of Latin America and the Caribbean to make his presentation. Good afternoon. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Pablo Andres Mota Delgado. I am the representative of an organization based in Colombia, and I'd like to share with you the experience of Latin America and the Caribbean on these issues. Taking into account the document of the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification, and the scientific conceptual framework for LDN that was approved in decision 18 of COP13, the Organizations of Civil Society of Latin America and the Caribbean state that the discussion document is focusing on 
identified needs and also we would like to share with you our views and our experience on this very important issue where land tenure is something that is much more important than ownership. First, in the context of the Latin American Caribbean region, there are different forms of land tenure. In some countries, we have seen fragmentation of land tenure, and in others, we've seen concentration of land in few hands. According to the FAO, 81% of the region farms fall within the definition of family farming, and family farming only represent the 23% 23% of agricultural area. Nevertheless, this family form of farming provides between 27 to 67% of food production. And also what needs to be mentioned is the fact that 16% of women manage farms or they are taking decisions on these issues in our region with only an increase of 5% in the last 10 years. Now, in connection with the documents that we're discussing, civil society organizations have looked to certain issues related to land tenure, and we believe that we need to promote the voluntary guidelines related to land tenure. And this is something that is necessary that will contribute to the government's management and the planning of the use of land resources. And this can help us achieve LDN and ensure that in the long term, we may avoid conflicts related to the use of land. Also, in addition to statu statutory tenure and customary tenure that the documents discuss. What needs to be also mentioned are land concessions made by governments to private enterprises for use of natural resources that are found in these lands. And this form of tenure cannot be considered to be as statutory or customary. In this respect, it would be necessary to consider this type of land tenure for the definition of VGGT. And I'm again repeating that this, what I'm talking about here is concessions, land concessions made by governments to private enterprises. In any case, on questions related to land secure tenure, we have realized that this does not guarantee sustainability and the achievement of LDN objectives. And that's why we believe that we should look into the different aspects that promote the return of young people to rural areas. And in this respect, in Latin America and the Caribbean, only 25% of the population lives in rural areas. And those who manage lands, head of households, are in their majority more than 50 years of, uh, 50 years old. And also land tenure and planning must be individual or community responsible because any absence of a person responsible makes it more difficult to plan and ensure adequate land management. Now I'd like to look at specific examples of land tenure in Latin America and the Caribbean. And we have the example, for example, the Quebra de Rice de Coco Babassu in Brazil where associations of women promoted a system of land tenure 
for the use of natural resources in private properties. Poor women without any access to land, which cultivate the coco barbasu in private lands, that ensures sustainability. And in this respect, the government of Brazil, as a result of the pressure of these communities of women, have developed public policies to guarantee free access for these women to natural resources. In any case, in Latin America and the Caribbean, community land tenure is a widespread practice. For example, in the Ejidos in Mexico or the peasant reserves in Colombia, and uh, these are cases where individuals do not own land, but can the community owns land, and the community administers and manages these lands that makes it possible to have conversions at the local level and finally guarantee in the long term a better sustainability in land use and also to ensure land degradation and neutrality. We also have examples of indigenous communities in Brazil, Colombia, Bolivia, and Peru, where we have seen indigenous communities, ancestral indigenous communities, promote their own methods and ways of land management that leads to very good land management that can contribute to LDN. And finally, I would like to highlight the efforts made by the Colombian government to ensure that land tenure is something that is possible for rural communities. And there were serious problems in land tenure security from the 1950s and thanks to the peace negotiations in Havana, a national policy for land tenure has been developed. In this respect, Colombia has developed a national policy for the restitution of land to communities, to indigenous populations, to young people and women in order to ensure that they return to rural areas and promote peace and security and food security. Colombia has moved even further, developing a national plan on the planification for the use of land that makes it possible and guarantees that land tenure is harmonized with the potential use of land. And here, civil society organizations play an important role in ensuring that land tenure policies make it possible for us to achieve objectives of LDN by integrating policy for land use and land planning building social capacities at the community level and the strengthening of networks of cooperation and work in rural communities, networks that make it possible to harmonize the work carried out at the highest level of decision making and to ensure that these policies are supported by and welcomed by local communities. And in this respect, we are focusing on promoting dialogue and we also would like to raise the question, how can we promote or ensure that land tenure security policies make it possible for individuals and rural communities to achieve, achieve land degradation, neutrality, food security, the reduction of poverty and peace building in Latin America and the Caribbean. Thank you very much. Gracias, Pablo.
Thank you very much, Pablo Mota, for your statement. And now I'd like to give the floor to the representative of the African group, Fatunata Wodo Sisoko from Mali. Merci bien. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, my fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is uh, Miss Sisusoko. I present the National Red Work of Women from Mali and our partner organization from the Network on Desertification. It is an honor for me to take a statement on behalf of NGOs in Africa and present the specific case of Burkina Faso on questions related to land tenure. I would like to first talk about the context of the problem, explaining why we took initiatives. And then I will focus on the impact of what has been done, the challenges that we face, and then I will make some concluding remarks. First, the context. Burkina Faso adopted in June 2009 a law on rural land tenure, law 034-2009 stroke AN. And after the adoption of this law with the support of the Millennium Challenge account, MCA, we prepared a guide for land tenure security. And in order to make it possible for women to have access to property titles, a dozen of organizations, member of SPONG, which is a network of NGOs, carried out actions on the ground that were based on the contents of the new guide on land tenure. Now I'd like to turn to the problem that led to the adoption of this initiative. And the main problem was, of course, the absence of land titles, which has led to the appropriation of lands that were exploited by women. And also, this has created difficulties in carrying out long-term activities on land plots. And also, some lands were confiscated in And this has led to a situation where during five years, 2010-2014, associate members of the SPONG network carried out information and public awareness activities, communication activities, training, and they implemented special programs targeting land tenure communities of villages and also commissions of land tenure reconciliation in villages. The impact of this work has led to the provision of 1,124 certificates of rural land tenure to women in 47 communities of Burkina Faso. And this made it possible to adopt good agricultural practices, good forest related practices, and the restoration of soils through half moons, stone cordons, and composting. Now, of course, we face some challenges. Many women still do not have APFRs. There is lack of access to funding, 
very often we see resistance from men and very often this relates to traditions and stereotypes that prevent women from having access to land and these are indeed challenges that in some way we manage to overcome and one of the conclusions that we would like to make is that these challenges is something that is common to most or all of the countries in Africa and we have seen that similar initiatives have been taken by civil society organizations at the national level and also community civil society organizations the west north east and the south of africa and this work has been carried out with our international partners for example the gwp the mca the icun the european union ifad USAID and others in order to guarantee agricultural prog progression uh, production with uh, special programs where women participate to the level of 80%. Thank you very much for your attention. Gracias, señora. Thank you very much, Ms. Fatimata. And as our last panelist, I'd like to give the floor to Ms. Natalie Van Halen from the Netherlands. Mr. Chairperson, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for giving me the opportunity to make a presentation in this open dialogue session on land tenure in the context of LDN. My name is Natalie Van Haren. I work at both ends, a civil society organization in the Netherlands, working with CSOs all around the world on inclusive natural resource management, on international capital flows, and on trade and investment agreements. I would like to share uh, some slides with you on the voluntary guidelines for the responsible governance of tenure of land, fisheries, and forest in the context of national food security, or in short, the voluntary guidelines on tenure. Mm, almost, yes. <laughs> Because of increasing competition over land resources due to popu population growth, changing consumption patterns, bad harvests all around the world in 2008, high demand for biofuels, urbanization, and financial speculation, there was a need for a common reference framework on the responsible, government of, uh, on the responsible governance of land. Mm. Um, therefore, in 2009-2010, FAO undertook consultations all around the world, and uh, this resulted in 10 regional consultations with governments, one consultation for private sector, four regional consultations for civil society in Malaysia, Brazil, Italy and Mali, and uh, this resulted in over 1,000 people from uh, 133 countries that, that who were actively engaged in this. Mm. Uh, after these 15 consultations, there was one document, it, which is this uh, mouthful of, uh, of guidelines, voluntary guidelines. Uh, the voluntary guidelines were adopted by the UN Committee on Fo World Food Security in October 2012. Uh, this is the, 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 the index of the, of the voluntary guidelines. Uh, first, you see uh, there, there, will, there is a, 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 a part one, preliminary, it sets the direction, and part two, on general matters. Mm. So what's the purpose of this uh, voluntary guidelines? The voluntary guidelines promote responsible governance of land with respect to all forms of tenure, public, private, communal, indigenous, customary, and informal. Their overarching goal are, goals are to achieve food security for all. They are also intended, intended to contribute to achieving sustainable livelihoods, social st stability, housing security, rural development, environmental protection, and sustainable social and economic development. The guidelines are meant to benefit all people in all countries, although there is an emphasis on vulnerable and marginalized people. Um, 
So the, the guidelines talk about responsible land tenure and, uh, in, in a way that it makes access to land, fisheries and forest more equitable. It helps ensure no one is subject to discrimination under laws, policies and practices. It leads to uh, more transparent and participatory decision making. It helps ensure disputes, over re are, disputes are resolved before they de degenerate into conflict and uh, it simplifi simplifies the administration of tenure and makes it more accessible and effective to all. So the third part is on legal recognition and allocation of tenure rights and duty, duties and uh, address the legal recognition of customary and or informal tenure rights of indigenous peoples and other communities. Uh, the fourth part is about transfer of tenure and other changes to tenure rights and duties and it addresses the tenure or re reallocation of existing rights and the associated du duties. Then part five, it's on administration of tenure and it addresses the administration of land users' rights uh, it, on, on records, on valuation, on taxation, on, on spatial planning, uh, on disputes and on transboundary matters. Part six is, uh, is uh, on climate change and uh, natural disasters and conflicts over tenure. Um, and part seven is on the promotion and implementation and evaluation of uh, tenure. The power of the voluntary guidelines is that they provide a framework that states can use on a voluntary basis. They allow government, civil society, the private sector and citizens to dialogue and agree on proposed actions. They encourage states to develop multi-stakeholder platforms to work on the implementation of the guidelines. They acknowledge that land governance is a step-by-step -step process that leads to transformative action on land tenure the power of the voluntary guidelines and the UNCCD. As, as the tenure guidelines were developed by so many actors that relate to and deal with land, there's an enormous support to implement them. The tenure guidelines are increasingly reflected in international agreement, agreements such as the Rio Plus 20 document, but also in the conceptual framework for land degradation neutrality. The conceptual framework for land degradation neutrality of the UNCCD science policy interface recognizes good land governance as an important condition to achieve LDN and the Sustainable Development Goal 15.3 target. It recognizes that the implementation of the tenure guidelines is central to how land degradation neutrality can be pursued with less risk and unintended uh, consequences associated with land tenure insecurity, land appropriation, and land conflict. The 2019 UNCCD SPI publication on an enabling environment for LDN that was discussed uh, last Tuesday, I believe, in CST, also recommends to implement the voluntary guidelines. So I, I go now, uh, uh, I would like to, to, to talk a little bit about countries working on implementation of, on, uh, of the voluntary guidelines. You see in this, in this uh, little map that, um, which I stole from FAO, um, uh, that, that a lot of people are, uh, a lot of countries are already uh, uh, implementing parts of, of this, these guidelines. So uh, the, these are the countries that are working on the multi-stakeholder platforms as proposed in the tenure guidelines. So again, several. These are countries working on policy and legal review, uh, review and formulation to implement the voluntary guidelines. So there are uh, some countries that already finalize processes of review or formulation of policy and or leg le legislation incorporating governance of tenure. And uh, there are some uh, countries, uh, there's, there's uh, in some countries an ongoing process. So it's 29 countries. There are countries working on improving their land administration system with tenure guidelines in their, in their hands. Um, yeah. And there are more initiatives going on. Countries like France, Germany and the Netherlands are adopting the voluntary guidelines in part of their national procedures. FAO has developed with countries and CSOs a support program on tenure, including capacity development. CSOs coordinated through FIAN have developed a people's manual on the voluntary guidelines. 
and CSOs all around the world are translating the ten tenure guidelines in local languages, for example in Malawi, in Senegal, in Sierra Leone and in Guatemala. Um, that was it, thank you. Bueno, muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much, Ms. Natalia Van Hanen, for her presentation. That brings our presentations to an end from the various uh, civil society organizations. I hope you're able to see and hear about various activities, various issues, and various solutions. We also heard a bit about uh, the implementation of the voluntary guidelines within a number of countries. Now I'm going to open up the floor and open up this interactive dialogue. I would like to invite anyone who wishes to take the floor to provide any responses or comments to do so. I would also ask civil society to speak up as well. I would ask them to take the floor to present their organizations and from what countries they're from. Therefore, I open up the floor for everyone who is present here. Thank you. República Dominicana. Tiene... Dominican Republic, you have the floor. Thank you, moderator. Thank you for giving me the floor on this very important topic. I'd like to thank uh, civil society and congratulate them on addressing this, uh, this issue. I just want to say something which is very important to me. I think land tenure is vital, really, in order to ensure security, to ensure peace, and to ensure that we achieve our objectives in environmental matters. Identification is necessary. We have to carry out an identification of key actors at local level on the ground, including women, including uh, farmers, fisher peoples as well, in order to promote production systems which uh, meet general targets and objectives relating to the environment in general, but in particular LDN. But really we need to know what indicators we're following on LDN. So these land productivity, land coverage and soil organic carbon. So it's very important to know what you're addressing in particular and to be aware of the complexity of the methodologies involved in order to achieve objectives. And this can be achieved by involving uh, people in general. For our specific context at this current moment in time with land tenure, the Dominican Republic really understands that each country has its own characteristics, its own legal instruments in order to manage uh, rural land tenure. These instruments need to be set out with technical components, taking into account equity and balance and justice, but also the characteristics of countries. So we agree on most of the criteria uh, within the documents presented, uh, but we'd like to insist upon the fact that uh, you have to respect these uh, domestic legal instruments and systems which are already in place with regards to land tenure in countries. The customary use of land also needs to be taken into account because this is also linked to justice and to well-being. But we have to move forward with prudence because uh, land tenure, in inverted commas, is important, but we have to keep property in mind as well. So we need clear legal instruments and regimes to ensure a peaceful tenure of land. So we believe in order, we believe in justice, and we also believe in the legal instruments in place in countries. Thank you. I thank the Dominican Republic and give the floor now 
to the European Union. Thank you, Chair. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to speak on behalf of the European Union and its member states. We would like to begin by emphasizing that the key element to achieve solid results in sustainable land use is to secure public participation in a transparent and fair manner. It is necessary to involve civil society in planning, implementation and monitoring of all governmental strategies. The EU is very concerned about the increasingly shrinking space for civil society organizations across the globe. Civil society should be considered as an essential partner and the EU will actively pursue opportunities for CSOs to engage with decision makers, be it at the local, national or global level. Furthermore, we must acknowledge that it is primarily due to the efforts of the CSO over the last years that the issue of land tenure is on the official agenda for this COP14. It is clear that advancing land declaration neutral neutrality happens at the local level and needs an enabling environment and land tenure is a key in this regard. There is a risk that without secure tenure or ownership, the targets and engagement to sustainability at local level are not addressed. This is in turn could lead into a situation where only immediate gains are targeted, whereas the underlying causes of unsustainability remain unsolved. When investments, investments in land restorations are being made, it is it is at the local level that land users are concerned and the CSOs play a crucial role in voicing and addressing land-related conflicts and supporting local land users. Furthermore, capacity building is needed for involving civil society. This means, means training of local stakeholders and administrations on communication tools and working methods to promote successful cooperation between the civil society, the public sector and other actors. Sharing of best practices is, is, is an effective way of training. For example, technical tools like geographical information systems, satellite monitoring and thematic maps provide excellent ways even at the local level to communicate on land use. Visualizing regional land use and land tenure assists local people who often have limited access to education and limited opportunities to participate in the dialogue on these issues. Ladies and gentlemen, it is imperative to reach mutual trust in the land use planning to understand the underlying causes of desertification at local level. Land use and land tenure can be complicated issues that often take a long time to be settled. Sometimes finding, finding a common language among stakeholders is difficult. The terminology and the ways to understand land use problems may differ between local people, administrations and experts. Civil society organizations play an essential role in building bridges for creating mutual, mutual understanding for the processes. There are already success stories to showcase how training and communication between all stakeholders have assisted in reaching consensus. Civil society organizations can play an important role in building the common trust. Including the issue of land tenure in the frame of UNCCD certainly fills an important gap. Once again, we thank the CSO for their effort in this regard. The draft decision on land tenure refers to important international agreed uh, open frameworks for land tenure and investments in land, namely VGCT and the principles for responsible investments in agriculture and food systems. systems. We fully support to have a substantial uh, decision on land tenure and we look for forward to the discussions this afternoon. I thank you for your attention. Muchas gracias a la rep Thank you very much to the representative of the European Union. I now give the floor to the representative of Argentina. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Chair. Argentina would like to thank the representatives of civil society for their presentations. The presentations really reflected 
points in common and shared points between the various regions. I think they also showed perspectives and aspects which were very specific to certain countries and regions. By region, I mean both supranational level and at provincial or state level, and even local or municipal level. So the relevance of land tenure cannot be denied. It's a central issue within the convention and has direct link with national circumstances and situations. We can't make a general statements. Given what was set out during the presentations, I'd like to highlight the need to guarantee the legal rights of uh, rural populations in terms of land tenure, but we also need to recognize the rights of persons who migrate to cities as well, if they wish to do so. Often this migration is uh, perfectly compatible with improvements in the quality of life of the people who are moving and improvements in environmental standards as well. Often nature benefits more from the lack of people on the ground than by our presence. In other areas, our interventions are paradoxically necessary in order to correct unsustainable practices carried out in the past. In many cases, urbanization is a result of modernization and will undoubtedly continue in the future as an expression of the desires of populations. For example, Argentina has traditionally been a strongly urbanized country. More than 92% of the country at present lives in uh, cities. Thank you very much, Chair. Gracias. I thank the representative of Argentina and now give the floor to the representative of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Mr. Chairman, I would like to take this opportunity to express our profound appreciation to the government and good people of the Republic of India for the warm hospitality extended to us since our arrival here in this city of, New of Delhi. The African region has taken note and endorsed the conclusion and recommendation presented by the UNCCD in document ICCD COP 1420 regarding land tenure rights, security and land governance. We also recognize the need for countries' party to take center stage in, build, in building upon and implementing the recommendation for improved land governance toward achieving our LDN target and the objective of the, of the UNCCD uh, strategy. Mr. Chairman, this notwithstanding, we observe that the effective implementation of the recommendation and the enormity of the issues involved go beyond the capacity of individual, individual governments. A concerted effort involving all relevant stakeholders, which include national government, the international community, funding agency and sources, private sector business entities, the UNCCD, UNCBD, UNFCC, and CSO would be required in the area of capacity building and knowledge sharing, among others. I want, therefore, to express our thanks to the CSO for all their very interesting presentations. Mr. Chairman, of particular relevance is the integration of land tenure issue, LDN, SDGs, and national strategy. In this context, technical assistance and funding will be needed for the implementation of the following activity, activities as elaborated in document ICCD COP 1420. First, our awareness-raising awareness raising and its accompanying capacity building. 
integration of multi-stakeholder platforms, establishment of partnership, review of policies, laws, and legal frameworks, bringing voluntary guidelines on the responsible governance of land tenure and specific guidance into plans to achieve LDN, the gathering relevant data, funding the investment in the integration effort, social and environment, environmental safeguards, integration into national policies. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Representative of the DRC. For your comments, I now give the floor to the Representative of Colombia. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Moderator. I'd also like to thank the panelists for their very interesting presentations. Colombia would also like to thank the Secretariat for drafting the working documents on land tenure. Colombia recognizes that the lack of legal security on land tenure is a factor which, uh, amongst others, has an impact on land degradation processes. In this regard, our country is working at national level on tangible measures, including targets and indicators, aiming to create the conditions necessary so that land tenure and uh, productive land use planning can develop uh, fisheries, productive inclusion and legal security. We're also implementing land restoration processes and restitution processes as part of the integral reform, including an agreement on an end to conflict. In this regard, our policies include the main instrument, which is the National Development Plan. And these will recognize that one of the main measures to control deforestation and to avoid uh, land degradation is to address land tenure through the implementation of the real estate uh, registry to ensure that they're not uh, unduly occupied or degraded. We're also implementing programs for the legalization of lands and the promotion of rural development for indigenous and Afro-descendant communities at national level. With regards to the document, which has been submitted for our consideration within this COP. Colombia shares the position that, uh, at a conceptual level, land tenure can have an impact on and influence land degradation and desertification. But we believe that it's important to take into account national circumstances, which vary significantly from one country to another on this topic, as you can see from the panel here. Therefore, for integrating new variables in the analysis of degradation processes, we would suggest focusing efforts on the improvement of processes already underway. These should focus the attention of the Secretariat and parties, in particular the report on the five strategic objectives, access to information with regards to the progress indicators, through the strengthening of national databases and transformative projects to combat desertification, land degradation and drought, and to achieve the voluntary targets on land degradation neutrality. So at the current time, we would not believe it relevant to include new reporting obligations, which would make uh, the collection and presentation of information even more complex. Thank you very much. Gracias. I thank the representative of Colombia and now give the floor to the representative of Brazil. Thank you very much, Mr. Facilitator, and uh, thank for all the presentations that came. They were all very instructive and uh, enriching in showing that this topic uh, really highlights the diversity of circumstances through the regions 
while also confirms that it is relevant to all countries and regions. Um, in some interpretations, in some pronouncements, perhaps if one was not aware of the larger context, uh, it would be easy to take the interpretation that some views see this topic as targeted only to some countries or only to some regions and um, not pertaining to, to challenges that are actually uh, relevant even to the most advanced and consolidated economies. It is really a global topic and that demands a wide variety of stakeholders. Uh, the process that took us to the, the voluntary guidelines, as was very well highlighted by, uh, by Mrs. Van, Van Haren, uh, was um, very very part participatory, was really global in its nature, and led to a document that is uh, accepted and cherished widely by many different actors, be they um, local communities, traditional and indigenous communities, but also farmers, also commercial producers on agriculture, and um, it really represents um, a, a document and contents and understandings that are well contained in that document. So for, for Brazil, there is no reason to replicate, to re-edit the discussions of the guidelines in the context of the UNCCD. And we say that as a positive message as a message to um, take the guidelines uh, as, a, as a tool, as many tools actually, considering how wide they are, and recognizing the context where they came from. And they, they come in the context of food security. They are geared towards exactly uh, to, to ensure that land remains productive, that it remains um, relevant to to our societies, be it as in agricultural way or be it in, a, in different sustainable uses for preservation. So in this regard, the guidelines are profoundly relevant to the implementation of the objectives of the UNCCD, but um, they are already agreed, they are already shared by, by everyone. So um, here in the context of the UNCCD, what we are uh, really interested in, in seeing is how they can inform our understanding of how land tenure issues are important for different activities and programs that are already ongoing, as highlighted by, by uh, different delegations, that uh, we, sh we should have uh, that kind of practical focus, not rediscussing what land tenure means or which kind of actors should be involved in one way or another, because we have already the guidelines, and that is a, um, uh, the, the context from which uh, Brazil thinks that we should approach the subject, which we think uh, has a place here in the UNCCD that is very relevant and we welcome this topic, but we do not welcome rediscussing the guidelines or trying to re-edit them, re-editing them in a different context from than that which uh, it comes from. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, representante de Brasil. Thank you very much, Brazil, for your statement. I now would like to give the floor to the representative of Gabon. Merci, monsieur le facilitateur. Thank you, Mr. Facilitator. Since Gabon was taking the floor for the first time, I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to the people and the government of India, and also thank the Secretariat for the documents and thank the panelists for their excellent presentations. Gabon supports the statements that are made by the African group and by the LDC group. We'd like to focus on two things. First, 
relates to the land tenure regime. Simply to say that these systems are different in different countries, something that needs to be taken into account. And also, these differences should be respected when we look at the national context. The second point, in Gabon, land belongs to the state. And a state distributes land titles and decides on the type of land use. In order to ensure land tenure justice, the government put into place something that we call the National Plan for Distribution of Land in order to ensure that all stakeholders that use land differently, that they have access to land. And the National Commission on Land, together with NGOs have put into place a system related to the funding that makes it possible to have a participative mapping of land use. So we have an idea how land is being used. And this approach is fully in line with what our convention is planning to achieve. So this is what I want to contribute to this discussion involving panelists. Thank you very much, Mr. Facilitator. Gracias, señor. I'd like to thank the representative of Gabon. Now I give the floor to the, rep to the representative of India. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as per the provision of Rule 10 of the Rules of Procedure of the COP, the second interstitial meeting of the COP 13 Bureau held in China endorsed the inclusion of new agenda item on land tenure under new and emerging issues for consideration of for COP 14. India appreciates the inclusion of land tenure as a new agenda item and it as an emerging issues globally. India being an agro-based economy completely agrees with the linkage between tenure security and land degradation. Mr. Chair, the review of the relationship between land tenure and land degradation includes a review of land tenure types and overviews of causal linkage between tenure security and land degradation. Mr. Chair, the positive impact of tenure security increases the resilience of population and ecosystem with a direct involvement of sustainable management of water resources and an impact on food security, job creation and economic investment, poverty reduction, gender equality and women's empowerment, migration, peace and stability. The land tenure system in India is variable depending upon different physiographical units of uh, India. Therefore, standardized, standardized measurement units along with uniform database generation system needs to be developed. The, the statutory and customary tenure, as, in, as mentioned in the document number 20, plays a very important role in the quality, productivity of land. People who depend on land that is undergoing degradation, most are small scale farmers who are most involved in the customary forms of tenure. Mr. Chair, the concept of integration of voluntary guidelines on the responsible governance of tenure with the implementation of LDN is an important initiative and is welcomed by Republic of India. Land tenure system prevailing in the country helps to lo locate the actual owner of the land by the government. Locating owner of the land is important for recovering land revenue and also to important agriculture development programs. Land tenure system makes the ownership of land more secure and permanent, which is very much important for the developing development of agriculture system. Land tenure system should establish a direct contact between the government and the former. Thus, in order to ensure an ideal land tenure system of the above mentioned features should prevail in the system and also maintained in the long term. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Gracias, señor representante de I'd like to thank the representative of India. Now I give the floor to the rep representative of Senegal. Merci, uh, Monsieur le Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. 
I would like to congratulate the panelists on the excellent quality of their presentations. And these presentations made it possible for us to better understand the link that exists between the land tenure regime and the need to reach the objective of land degradation and neutrality. I think it was very important to take a look again at these questions that have been supported by the examples provided from different regions. The land tenure question that was discussed this morning is a subject that is considered to be an emerging issue, but it has a special importance that has been recognized during the previous conference of parties and we should praise the work carried out by civil society actors that have been advocating this subject in order to ensure that this issue is covered during the discussions in the conference and that there's a link to our combat against desertification so senegal supports the statement that was made by the Congo on behalf of the African group and we would like to also talk about uh, the guidelines that were mentioned but before doing that I'd like to say that the question of land plays a special importance from the point of view of trade and all of this is obviously linked to the question of climate change and as a result, Senegal took several initiatives. The most recent one is land reform, with the establishment of National Commission of Land Reform that presented a draft political document on land tenure that refers to the voluntary guidelines for the responsible use of lands, but also something that is applied to fisheries and forests in the context of food security. So starting in 2007, my country has been working with the support of the FAO in order to have a mixed approach involving different stakeholders in order to operationalize these directives or these guidelines in Senegal in our use of natural resources. And these guidelines helped us define standards that have been internationally recognized to have responsible policies that provide a framework for the government, private actors, and civil society to be used in the preparation and elaboration of policies and programs, programs aimed at ensuring food security. And obviously, we have been providing technical assistance to raise awareness, building multi-stakeholder platforms, and ensure capacity building in order to have also an assessment of how these policies and national laws are implemented to ensure the effective nature of this worker work. Also an important question relates to access of women to land and we do support this process to ensure a balance and in this approach to lands. Thank you. I'd like to thank the representative of Senegal and I give the floor to the representative of Switzerland. Thank you, Chair. And uh, Switzerland would like to thank the panel for their overview and their insights into a crucial topic. Um, Switzerland supports the, the voluntary guidelines since its inception, since the elaboration. Um, we were part of this process and it didn't stop with the adoption by the Committee on World Food Security and the recognition uh, through ECOSOC at the UN General Assembly. Um, we also support the implementation of these voluntary guidelines based on demand by, by countries. Uh, we believe that in the context of the convention and the and land degradation neutrality secure tenure rights especially the, the legitimate tenure rights but also the, the customary rights are key if a farmer should invest in his land to have healthy land 
um, for future generations. He also want to um, get the yield out of his investment and um, have the crops or ha get the crops he or she produced. As combating desertification, land degradation takes time to get healthy soil. Um, you need to have uh, secure tenure rights. Switzerland believes that there will be no land degradation neutrality without secure tenure rights. Um, especially when you look at women and, and tenure rights. There are few women compared or the percentage of a woman um, having land and having secure land rights is quite low compared to men. But on the other side, when you look how much um, work women uh, provide to, to, um, on, in agricultural work, but also for the agricultural production, um, it, they exceed the, the amount of work men do. So we believe um, to have secure tenure rights is key but also to focus on, on gender in this regard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Gracias. Thank you. To the representative of Switzerland, and now I give the floor to the representative of Burkina Faso. Thank you. Since it is the first time that Burkina is taking the floor, we would like to express our recognition to the people of India for helping in the organization of this COP meeting. And we also would like to congratulate the Secretariat for the, on the excellent organization of this meeting and also thank civil society for helping us focus on land tenure issues and we'd like to thank the panelists for their presentations it is important to say that land tenure issues are very important if we wish to succeed in our work to ensure land degradation neutrality In Burkina Faso, this question, in many cases, especially when land is used, it means that owners very often are in a difficult situation in terms of land tenure security. And this is why we think that this question should be covered as we work under the convention. And we should focus on capacity building. And in this respect, Burkina Faso supports a statement made by the DRC on behalf of the African group. And we think that our own experience shows can only be dealt with with the participation of all stakeholders. And this is why land tenure governance that has been put into place in Burkina Faso involved all stakeholders. and. We also are trying to take into account traditional policies, our customs, and without that, without taking into account the national context, we won't be able to ensure land tenure security. And we should see, together with the Secretariat, how we can take advantage from different national practices and ensure capacity building taking into account the experience of different countries in order to be successful 
in ensuring land degradation neutrality. Thank you. Gracias. I'd like to thank the representative of Burkina Faso. And now I would like to give the floor to representatives of civil society. Please present your organizations and your country. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Tanvir Arif, coming from Pakistan, representing SCOPE and International Land Coalition. And I'm pleased to say that uh, I'm happy that we see this uh, issue of uh, land tenure on the agenda of UNCCD, as we were the instrumental in introducing this subject during COP9, when we, along with International Land Coalition, organized a side event uh, at COP9. So this is an essential subject in the context of uh, combating desertification and land degradation neutrality. As the land is experiencing a lot of pressure due to climate change and corporate agriculture in various countries, such as my country in Pakistan, uh, land is being rapidly degraded and uh, there is a need to, to reform the land governance laws. So we think that uh, these voluntary guidelines, VGTT, provides excellent opportunity to transform uh, action to the grassroots level. And uh, in this context, we, the CSOs, would like to see these VGTT as becoming a legal instrument at the national level by involving civil society organizations. As we all know that uh, civil society organizations have rich experience. Uh, they work with the indigenous people, they work with the uh, local uh, populations and women groups. So this is our submissions that uh, while developing national uh, platforms to implement VGTT, uh, civil society organizations should be involved. And we really appreciate the statement made by the European Union who emphasized the inclusion of civil society organizations in this process. Thank you, Chair. Bueno. Thank you very much to the representative of civil society. We have listened to 11 delegations representing countries that shared with us their views. And we also listened to the representative of the European Union. There have been five panel presentations and also the views of a civil society organization. I see that there's another request for the floor. Please present yourself. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I'd like also to thank the facilitator. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, Good morning. Thank you very much for this opportunity to address you within the context of COP14. I'm Dr. Mohammed Zuhairi, and I'm speaking on behalf of Al Aksam Foundation, Organization for Agriculture and Environment Development in Iraq. Together with civil society organizations in Asia. I'd like to raise an important topic uh, about the role of society organizations in achieving LDN and how we can allow society to be an important player and to participate uh, greatly in achieving the goal of the LDN and how to allow also society to participate in national programs uh, on land tenure. 
Civil society's participation is still very limited. It's even non-existent in some countries. Given this reality, my question to all the stakeholders is the following. What are the means that would allow us to implement the strategies and the decisions of the COP when society organizations are, are not allowed to participate in supporting local communities in order to combat land degradation and to reinforce land tenure? I'd like to express my appreciation of the EU statement on the importance of supporting civil society to be part of decision making on land tenure and to address conflicts which ensue from, from them, and also on the need of to build capacities of civil society organizations. In Iraq, and particularly in places where there were migration and internal displacements, these issues of uh, displacement show that displaced people usually lose uh, uh, land tenure documents. So th therefore, we need to ensure those documents to prove that people have right to land. In COP 13, ICCD COP 14 L 10, that decision stressed on uh, the, the need to allow society organization to participate in national programs. In Iraq, we have a customary law in most of the provinces, provinces of Iraq, which says that land is for the farmers, those who cultivate it. However, influential people and cooperation stand in the way of farmers' rights, particularly female farmers' access to lands given also tribal traditional uh, uh, norms. I reiterate my thanks to you. I would like to thank I give the floor to the representative. Yes, please, could you turn on the microphone so we can hear you, representative of Intern governmental organization. No, bueno. Eh, volvemos. We have listened, as I have already mentioned, views from governments, representatives of organizations, and I'd like to ask our panelists and see whether you have any comments, if you want to share some of your views, and we'll be focusing on the objective for our meeting, in other words, a dialogue. We are not adopting any decisions, but we are having an interactive dialogue. So I'd like to ask panelists whether you would like to react to what was said in the room. I'm not sure who would like to do that. Valentin, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to thank to distinguished delegates from all countries who mention the role of civil society organizations in this process and uh, that uh, almost all countries are willing to uh, involve civil society uh, in uh, uh, solving these problems of land tenure. I fully agree with the distinguished uh, representative of Switzerland that uh, uh, LDN can't be achieved without land tenure security. And uh, I want to thank a lot to distinguished delegates of uh, European Union 
who encouraged to involve civil society organizations in the process of uh, in the uh, process of solving the problem, including uh, in the creation of the platform of VGGPs. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I would like to thank to all distinguished delegates as well on their enthusiastic attitude to the presenters on this important topic and respect to our recommendations and uh, asking about inclusion CSOs and other stakeholders in this process. I just would like to ensure and put more focus and add according to the result of review of existing literature review of the five country analysis in Australia, Cameroon, Mexico, Philippines and Tanzania, the legal recognition of collective customary rights promotes and enable conservation of natural resources and biocultural diversities. Therefore, it is very essential for land degradation neutrality. Also, the results shows that legal recognition of indigenous and community conserved areas or ICCAs that have been approved by IUCN and UNCPD have all built upon previous legal recognition of collective tenure rights and it contributed to the condition necessary for communities to manage their land in a way that achieves conservation results and land restoration. Thank you. Gracias, Najib. Thank you very much. Bueno, agradecer. Yes, I would like to thank all of the delegates that took the floor, Senegal, Switzerland, the del delegate from the European Union, also India, Pakistan, that use these guidelines in order to ensure that countries can focus on questions of land tenure security at the individual and community levels regardless of their origin and look at the different features in specific countries. Indeed, land tenure security contributes in a great way to resolve social conflicts and conflicts related to land use. And these guidelines and national policies that are based on these guidelines on questions related to land tenure can help us use our land correctly. As the representative of Argentina has said, we indeed have to focus on the uh, situation of communities and uh, where they are focusing on their land. But we also have to remember that in order to ensure the right balance in all of this, we should focus on the guidelines and public policies, and we can use them to restore degraded lands. Thank you very much, Ms. Fakumata. Thank you. I'd like to join my colleagues, other panelists, and to sincerely thank all of those who took the floor to talk about the question of land tenure, and especially those that focused on the role of civil society that can guarantee the uh, such land regimes that uh, land tenure systems that focus on the most vulnerable groups of the population, especially women and uh, children. And of course, there are already existing legal frameworks. And there are legal texts that already exist in our countries, but all of these have to be placed into the correct context of land uh, tenure systems. And without that, we won't be able to talk about food security in our countries. And I support what was said by Gabon, because 
very often the efforts that are being put into place are not enough. It's, uh, countries do not have the relevant uh, capacities, and African countries need support to do this work. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll now give the floor to Nasali. Thank you. Um, well, it's uh, very good to hear that uh, so many countries agree that land degradation neutrality and land tenure security are uh, so close linked with each other, as our host, our host India, stated so eloquently, much more, much more eloquently than I can do. Um, uh, as a reaction to the Dominican Republic and Argentina and uh, Gabon. Um, the voluntary uh, tenure guidelines are indeed recognizing the different tenure systems and that, uh, that it is a step-by-step -step, uh, process to, to come to responsible uh, governance of land. Um, then there was an other... I, I also heard some, some concerns or some ideas on the opera operationalization of responsible land governance. Uh, what I know of FAO, they have developed uh, very nice. Uh, uh, yeah, they have, have developed a, a, a capacity uh, development program, and uh, amongst others, with different guides or technical guides on uh, uh, women and men, on pastoral la lands, on investors, on the commons, on agricultural investments, which is. Uh, which yeah, but which it's very interesting to to look into this. Um, then I I think the European Union statement on shrinking civic space. Uh, in my organization, both ends we work a lot with, uh, as I said, with with civil society organizations all around the world on natural resources uh, management, and uh, they also telling us the same that uh, that that there is the, the space for civic civil society uh, is shrinking. In, in the discussions on land, in discussions with uh, uh, investments. Um, so uh, thank you very much for, for, for stating it. And then, um, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I also, we, we also, or I also think the, the, the comment of, of Switzerland, uh, if I heard it correctly, that they support the uh, implementation on demand of countries. Maybe that's also interesting or to, to, to elaborate a little bit on that. And uh, while I'm uh, with Switzerland now, uh, I would really like to thank Switzerland for supporting the, uh, the work of the CSO panel here in the UNCCD. Thank you very much. Bueno, muchísimas gracias, Natalie. Thank you very much, Natalie. Undoubtedly, the goal of this dialogue is being achieved in a very successful manner. I think we have been listening to one another, listening to our distinct positions and distinct visions. But what's rising is the need to really look at this issue in depth recognizing its complexity, recognizing its diversity, but recognizing how relevant this topic is. But here, many delegations and panelists and others have spoken about the tools available. These include the voluntary guidelines, We've heard about the need to not reinvent the wheel, as someone said, one of the delegations said. Essentially, then, we've heard about the link between the guidelines and the efforts to achieve LDN and sustainable land tenure. So I think with those messages, with those proposals, which we've heard from this panel and from the room during our dialogue, I think that we are moving towards what we're trying to achieve. So I'd like to thank all the parties for, uh, 
facilitating our discussions in the context of the official agenda. I'd like to thank the Secretariat for their efforts as well. I would ask if anyone else would like to take the floor, if there are any additional comments to be made. In any case, the floor is open once again, if anyone would like to take the floor. At the back, I think. One second. I see a specialized agency at the back that would like to take the floor. You have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, moderator. It's the United Nations Organization for Food and Agriculture, FAO. The FAO, I'd like to congratulate you on the outcome of this interesting dialogue. I think has been conducted in a very participatory manner. The FAO believes it's an honor to be able to take part with other countries and civil society organizations in the implementation of the voluntary guidelines on land tenure and governance of uh, forest resources and fisheries. These voluntary guidelines, as you know, were approved in the Food Security Commission, which is a joint commission of the FAO, alongside FIDA and the World Food Programme. So this joint commission, CFS, met initially in 2012 and approved these voluntary guidelines. The FAO, alongside its partner organizations within the UN system, in particular those that are part of the CFS, are ready to support civil society organizations and member countries of the UNCCD to transform them into national and local guidelines and action. Thank you very much. Senor Hi, thank you. Representative of the FAO. I now have a request for the floor from a civil society organization. I'd like to invite them to present themselves and then take the floor. You have the floor. Uh, th oh. Thank you, moderator, and thank you, uh, president. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of civil society. My organization is uh, Young Naturalist Network. I would like to mention some uh, point here. It is to uh, request to party and uh, also to uh, secretariat and all of you. Uh, my first point is that regarding uh, land tenure issue, we have one uh, agenda item uh, that is uh, COP 1420. Uh, here uh, in my organization and some of our civil society organization, we look that uh, there are some lackings there in text. So my uh, request is to uh, uh, national delegation who are present here, uh, please look uh, that text uh, which I want to mention here. Uh, first, in 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 point C, uh, migration, it, uh, the word should be uh, FMD, means forced migration, uh, displacement, and uh, a, paragraph, a new paragraph should include here. And in point five, gender equality and women's empowerment. Quiero interrumpirlo un segundo. If I may, I'd just like to interrupt you for a second. My apologies, but uh, we're not in a context of negotiating any text here. This is an interactive dialogue between uh, civil society and government. To clarify, your opinion on this topic would be good, but not just uh, statements because this isn't uh, a discussion of specific paragraphs uh, so apologies for interrupting but I just want to make that clarification please oh, uh, 
uh, thank you sir moderator sir then uh, i'm skipping that one but i would like to mention one thing that uh, in uh, even ccd uh, system we are looking that some civil society space is uh, sinking especially for some reason uh, we would like to get support from all of national parties from secretariat and from CSO panel also thank you for giving me a space muchísimas gracias thank you very much representative of civil society organization if there are no other requests for the floor I would like to first and foremost thank you all for expressing your opinions and for taking part in this dialogue I'd like to congratulate my colleagues from civil society who took part on the panel and who took part in the room as well I see a request for the floor from Guinea-Bissau. You have the floor. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you very much, moderator. Following on from others who spoke before me, I'd like to start by congratulating the panelists. I asked for the floor because I felt that there was one aspect that was not very well clarified within the various presentations. They addressed many aspects, including uh, customary management and uh, land tenure. But I think there's one aspect that is fundamental, which is not mentioned, and that's uh, the integration of traditional management of uh, land resources with positive law. So how to reconcile customary law and uh, Western law. I heard the colleague from the FAO talking about the guidelines established by the IFAD and FAO. These guidelines are of a Western nature but need to take into account cultural aspects and social aspects and traditional aspects on the ground in other countries and even uh, ethnic aspects of land tenure or ethnological rather. So land tenure is a very complex issue which can vary from one country to another and from one society to another and from one ethnicity to another. So all of these uh, issues need to be taken into account in uh, land reform and land tenure reform needs to be carried out by states. I think this reform also uh, includes a food security sector in order to uh, manage natural resources as a whole, so forests, water, uh, fisheries, I think all of these areas are essential for uh, land tenure and land management. Thank you. Gracias, representante. I thank the representative of Guinea-Bissau for those comments. Now, if there are no more requests for the floor, I see a representative of the plurinational state of Bolivia is requesting the floor. You have the floor. Hello. Eh, reciban los saludos. I'd like to express thanks of uh, Bolivia to all of our brother and sister states. Express our thanks to Mother Earth. And particular thanks to the president of this convention and to the secretariat. We'd like to focus on references uh, made by our brother country of uh, Guinea-Bissau in the sense that in Bolivia we're working on land tenure at the level of communities. We want to eradicate the legacy of uh, colonization within our country. We are reassigning land back to communities and to indigenous or original farming communities. 
and to ensuring that uh, women have a hereditary right to land as well. We want to ensure equitable redistribution of land to men and to women, to ensure that everyone has the right to access land, to access property. Our economy is a pluralistic community economy. Really, we want to respect the wealth and riches of our planet Earth. One of these uh, areas of wealth is land, and then water, and humanity. These are the three main areas of wealth and the basis for all sustainable development. It's also the foundations for the economy in our state. So in eastern Bolivia, for example, we've uh, redistributed a large uh, proportion of uh, land back to communities, and now we're working to do this throughout the country mainly in order to uh, take land back from these large corporations and redistribute them. We only take account uh, the uses and customs of our peoples. We need to ensure that land is respected, that biodiversity and ecosystems are respected and we think that indigenous, original, and farming populations do this best. Thank you. Gracias. I'd like to thank the representative of the plurinational state of Bolivia. Are there any other additional comments? I see no more speakers requesting the floor. So, once again, I'd like to thank you all for taking part in this dialogue. I'd like to thank the High Authority of the COP, the President, for taking part. I'd thank the Secretariat. And thank you all for expressing your very diverse opinions and thoughts. I think we heard some very interesting opinions that will help us as civil society and uh, surely parties the convention to adopt the best possible positions within this COP on this topic. So all that's left to say is to give back the floor to the president of the COP so that they can offer some concluding remarks for this interactive dialogue, this open dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Perez Pardo. I also thank our speakers today for their presentations and all the delegation and civil society organizations for actively participating in this important dialogue. Distinguished delegates, while the overall arching, overarching issue of land degradation neutrality will be a major point of discussion during this COP. I must compliment the COP for having had an inclusive discussion on land tenure. Land tenure is actually very critical, but I guess as critical it is, it is also that complicated. Because there is no one solution or one answer for various regions of this world. And globally, different solutions have been found or different attempts are being made to find solutions to land tenure issues and sustainable land tenures. But we all need to continue to combine our wisdom individually and collectively and look at this issue. The civil society organizations will certainly have a major role in ensuring that community and government are in a position to take informed decisions. It has been a serious and constructive session with very fruitful presentations from both the civil society organizations 
as well as the member states. The presentations that we had today gave us an idea of the depth and methodology of the CSO work in different regions of the globe. I feel one of the best ways of doing well is learning from others. Sharing of experience is therefore a very critical aspect. And I do hope that we'll continue to learn from each other in our ed endeavor to achieve our objective. Distinguished delegates, we have now come to the end of our first open dialogue on the inclusion of activities of civil society organizations within the official program of work of the Conference of Parties. Before adjourning, I would like to invite the Secretariat to make some announcement concerning the work of the conference. Secretariat, you have the floor. Thank you, sir. We would like to inform the delegates that the next meeting of the Conference of the Parties will take place on Friday, 6th of September, in the Plenary Hall in the afternoon, immediately after the closing of the Committee on Science and Technology. The second open dialogue session with the civil society will take place on Wednesday, 11 of September, in the Plenary Hall at 10 a.m. The subject of that open dialogue session will be intergenerational cooperation for land restoration, including land tenure, security, green jobs, and migration. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Secretariat. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you.